All right, guys, we'll have 11 o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome. And, uh, before we dive into our topic for the day, which is going to be multiple instance learning, uh, just a few announcements. I sent these announcements via Canvas as well, so you guys have, uh, and, and I think you guys are well aware that you have a final project uh, this month, which is going to be due at the end of the course. Uh, but the first step of this project is to get uh, the project approved. So I asked that everyone send in a project proposal to me via email, just so that I understand the basic scope of the, your project and that I can confirm that it's appropriate uh, for our course. So please send those to me by the end of the week. Uh, the sooner the better so you guys can get started and dedicate more time to the projects. Uh, with respect to scheduling, these project presentations will likely be scheduled during the last class for, uh, for the term, and we can begin scheduling uh, once I have a good idea as to how many project presentations there are going to be. Again, the presentation is optional, and you get awarded points based on how you plan to present and or document your final project. And so project presentation is one of the many options available to you. Uh, and so we'll review those here qu quickly to see if there are any uh, outstanding questions with respect to those. All right, with that in mind, I'll go ahead and bring us to the course room page. And if we have any questions at that point, we can chat about that. Let's go ahead and change the share here. All right, so here's our course page. And then so here's where we are, right? We're beginning to wrap things up near the end of the term. You guys just completed your exam. Uh, and I hope to have those graded and back to you by the end of the week. Uh, I'll certainly send out an announcement when that is done. Uh, again, as a reminder, you can find the final project here. Uh, moving forward, note that we will have no more in-class assignments. Instead, I want you to spend the uh, appropriate remaining portion of class time to working and collaborating with your peers with respect to your final projects and or scheduling meetings with me, especially if you plan to submit a technical paper as part of your final project. I would like to schedule some chats with you to make sure that uh, you have that process set up. Uh, you understand all the details associated with submitting a technical paper to a conference. And, uh, and I can certainly help you guys with respect to the steps associated with that. And so we'll dedicate class time to that as appropriate moving forward. So keep that in mind uh, as you go through your uh, project and as you submit your proposal. And, uh, today, our topic is going to be multiple instance learning. I've posted a survey which covers many of the seminal work in this area and some of the latest and greatest and state-of-the-art work in this area. And so this is a you know, relatively uh, new learning paradigm within the scheme of, multiple, of uh, machine learning, uh, yet it's a learning scenario that's encountered quite a bit, especially when you have noisy data or non-ideal learning scenarios. And, and so it's a very useful topic, advanced topic in machine learning, and so uh, it's a great concept to inject in this particular course. And since it's relatively new, and I would say relatively uninvestigated in the field of data science, I think it provides for a very intriguing and interesting project topic. And if you want to investigate models, new models, new applications, and or new optimization schemes, right, this particular learning topic is just excellent for, for, these, uh, for this exploration. Uh, so I would encourage you guys to uh, investigate multiple instance learning, especially if the topic interests you after our discussion today. And again, if you were to look at the final project, I note that uh, some of these predetermined projects are in fact uh, related to multiple instance learning. And so again, if you guys do find that you want to pursue a topic in this area, right, uh, I think that would be great, though it's certainly not necessary. And if you want to proceed with 
uh, presentation. Proceed with a technical competition submission or technical paper submission. Please make sure that you include that in your project proposal and just keep me updated as you move forward. All right, at this point, I'll go ahead and open it up to questions. If you guys have any questions, I'll mute myself for about 30 seconds. If you guys have any questions about the final project or our path forward, uh, feel free to type them up or unmute yourself in chat. All right, guys, if there's no questions, we'll go ahead and dive into our topic for the day, right, which is going to be multiple instance learning. Right, note that uh, you know, before I was at Georgetown, I was a research scientist at the University of Florida. Right, and so a lot of the research that I did in this area, I did while there. And so I do apologize for the, for the Gator logo here, though not, not that that much. I think, you know, the University of Florida is a great university. Uh, Georgetown University is also a great university. So uh, I think that I think that both universities are great, though I, I have kept the, the logo here on the backdrop of this PowerPoint slide deck in the area of multiple instance learning. Now, a lot of the research that I did at the University of Florida was in the area of computer vision and, and machine learning and sort of the confluence of the two. And uh, multiple instance learning is one of those advanced learning concepts that pops up quite a bit in computer vision and image processing, as well as a number of other areas. And so uh, it was a tool that we found quite useful there. And that is becoming uh, very popular and gaining popularity at the, in the community at large. And you see it a lot more now in conferences and journals, right? If you go to any machine learning conference, computer vision conference, even data science conferences nowadays, though not as much in data science quite yet. It hasn't spread to that community yet as much, right? You'll find at least one talk on multiple instance learning. And this was certainly not the case five and 10 years ago. Uh, and so, so it has certainly been gaining popularity as it is quite useful uh, in certain scenarios. And so we'll learn what scenarios uh, moving forward here in just a moment. All right. First, and I want you guys to participate in this to help motivate the problem. It'll get you sort of thinking and understanding uh, what is multiple instance learning. And this is just a really good motivation problem, which was introduced in the seminal work by Dietrich et al. Um, back in the 90s. And so this is the locksmith example. And so I will pose the following problem to you. Right. So assume that you are a locksmith and you're working for some company or some office space and you're, you're faced with the following problem. Let's say that all employees carry a key ring with many, many keys. And so you have a big office, you have a lot of employees. They all have a key ring with many keys. The senior employees have access to the supply room. Junior employees do not. And so you, in a sense, have two classes of employees. One class has access to the supply room. One class does not. You're the locksmith, and your goal is to uh, create a copy of the key for the supply room. So you want to identify which key is the key that opens the supply room. The employees do not tell you which keys open this supply room. 
but they just simply give you their key ring. So you have a key ring or maybe a box of key rings from the senior employees and a box of key rings from the junior employees. How would you go about determining? Like what sequence of steps, what algorithm would you follow? What process would you follow as a human? Right? Would you go to try to identify which key you would use or declare to be the storage key room? So what process would you follow? So I'll let you guys ponder that over for a couple of minutes and see if you guys have any thoughts about that. You can uh, unmute yourself and, and let me know what you think. How would you go about solving this problem? So any initial thoughts, uh, April? Uh, yeah, sure. So yeah. Um, since the senior employees have access to the supply room, I would first determine if the key that I got is from the senior employee or the junior employee. Um, and then from there, or um, since I'm wondering if you can also get the junior employee keys and then compare uh, what keys um, they both have and then the one key that they don't have matching would be the supply key. There's a lot of assumptions behind that, but I, mean, I think that would be my process. Yeah, I think that's great. And I think your ob observation that there are certainly some assumptions you're gonna have to make uh, are correct, but the, that's exactly the basic idea here. The goal here is, and thank you very much, April, um, it's for helping to motivate this problem, right? To try to identify which key would be the storage key would be as essentially the following. Try to identify which key is shared by all the senior employees that none of the junior employees have, right? So this is a key. And if you're lucky, they'll just be just the one key, right? Uh, it, in theory, you could have multiple keys that uh, meet that uh, criteria. And so, as you're noting, there might be some assumptions here. Uh, but, but ideally, that would be what we would be looking for. And that would be, you know, given the information we have, given the constraints, that would be our, uh, our path forward, right? And so this is the multiple instance learning problem. Uh, and so you can categorize this or classify this learning scenario in a number of different ways, uh, right? This is, in a sense, supervised learning with a non-optimal learning scenario, a non-ideal learning scenario. You can see this as label uncertainty as you're presented with lots of keys. All right, you can label this type of supervised learning as a uh, noisy learning scenario or a learning scenario where you have a noisy teacher, right? Uh, so there's a lot of different ways you can spin this learning scenario, right? But in, in a more general sense, it's a non-ideal supervised learning scenario, which happens quite a bit in the real world, where we don't have perfect labels or perfect data for machine learning applications. And so let's go ahead and look at some of this and do a comparison with standard machine learning and supervised learning scenarios. So in our standard machine learning scenario, we have a supervised learning where we have some number of samples, let's say n samples, and each of them have labels. Right. So this is standard, right? This is what we're hoping for. And then we can apply standard supervised learning scenarios. Uh, in multiple instance learning, we have a situation where we have multiple instances. And so the multiple instances are all of these keys on a key ring, for example. So each key ring has multiple instances or multiple keys. And we want to uh, try to identify you know, which of these instances is in fact the target. Right. 
uh, we have labels in a sense for each of the key rings. So for sets of keys or sets of samples, we know whether they were a junior employee or a senior employee, right? We knew that they were either in target class A or, or class B, right? Um, but we don't necessarily know which instance in the key ring or which key is actually the target or actually the instance that we're looking for, right? And so here, uh, in a comparison, we can see that, let me pull up my pointer. Right. Here we can see that we have some number of samples here, but we don't necessarily know the labels of all the samples, but we have some label information. Oops. Right. And the label information for multiple instance learning can be specified as follows. Right. We have, rather than individual samples with labels, we have sets of samples where a label is associated with a set, not the individual samples in the set. Right. So rather than having samples, we have what we refer to as bags in this particular community. Right. These bags are sets of samples, and a bag is labeled as positive if we know that they're within the bag there is a target sample, if you will, and it's labeled as negative if we know that there is not a target sample in the bag. Right? So again, the analogy here is if we know that there is the supply key in the key ring, then it's positive. If we know that it's not there, it's negative. Right? We can assign labels to the bags as follows. Right? We say that the bag is positive if there exists at least one sample in the bag that induces our target concept, or that is the target. And then we say it's negative if all of the samples are negative. So for the negative bags, we kind of do have labels for each of the samples. We know that they are all negative in that instance. So given this constrained learning scenario where we have some uncertainty with respect to the labels associated with each sample or observation, right, our goal is to learn this target concept, learn the model, learn the mapping, Right, to learn the overall scheme, learn the overall concept. Right. And so visually speaking, this is what we have. Right. A bag is a set of samples. A sample within each bag you can refer to as an instance. A bag is labeled positive if and only if at least one of the instances is positive. So we might have multiple instances that are positive, or just one, but there's at least one. We don't necessarily know which one or which ones. What we do know in our negative bags that there should be no targets in those bags. All right, so where does this type of learning pop up in machine learning applications? Well, it first popped up uh, as the initial author and the creator or designer of multiple instance learning that designed uh, Dietrich uh, back in the 90s in drug activation prediction. The idea here is that uh, the researchers wanted to identify which drug had the desired effect. However, apparently these drugs and these different molecules can take on different shapes. And so each drug had actually a set of shapes that it could take on, but only some of these shapes would have the desired activation. Right? Thus, each drug or each molecule or, or such it could be represented as a set of, of shapes or potential activations, if you will. And so rather than trying to label each drug, right, we had this multiple instance learning scenario where we want to identify which of the shapes would actually induce the desired activation. And this is a problem that's also countered quite a bit in computer vision and in image classification. Right, and you can think about this for those of you who have done any research in this area. Right, if you were to try to train an image or try to train a classifier, for example, to recognize, uh, let's say, waterfalls or automobiles or some uh, some item within an image, right? odds are, when you go to your data set or your database and you start pulling these images it's unlikely that you're going to have a waterfall, a perfect waterfall, centered in the image without anything else in the image. Usually you're going to have maybe a waterfall, you might have some rocks, maybe some trees, right? There's going to be other stuff in the image as well. 
And so when you try to present this information to a learning algorithm, there's a lot of extra stuff in here. Right? There's a lot of extra noise or a lot of extra observations, other samples, if you will, in the image. And so this is like a multiple instance learning problem, right? Because you're actually presenting the learner with a bag of information, right? And you might be saying, all right, learn waterfall. Right? But in each instance, in each image, in each bag, you might have waterfall, but you might have other stuff like tree and mountain or rocks or sun or something like this. Right? Uh, and so this is a multiple instance learning scenario. And thus, if we were able to explicitly account for this in the learning scheme, we should have improved results. Right, here's some research that I did while at the University of Florida related to this. And again, this is an image processing. On the right here, you see a ground penetrating radar image. The goal here is to identify subsurface objects underground. Right? The subsurface object here is pretty easy to identify. Right? However, note that there's other stuff in the image as well. Right? Again, these are radar images, so uh, it's the intuition as to what you're looking at here is not clear unless you're familiar with radar images. Right? But the idea of having multiple instances in this image, right, or multiple observations rather than just the target observation is quite clear. Right? For example, if we were to segment this image into sub-images, right, compute features, Right? We would have multiple features for this entire image. And so if we put all of these different features in a bag and then applied a multiple instance learning scheme to it, we could identify which parts of the image, which sub-images actually induced the target concept or contained the item we're looking for. Right? Using a similar scheme, as April noted, with our key rings. Right? We just go through all of the positive bags identify which patterns are common, look at all the negative bags, identify which targets or which patterns are not in those, right? and we should have our target concept or the target pattern, and we can use that information to train our models better. And at this point, I'll take a break to see if this concept makes sense or if you guys have any questions about the overall idea or motivation of multiple instance learning. I have a question. Um, so you were mentioning that we can uh, identify, um, I guess, the target by comparing it to um, like the patterns of what we know is true and what we know isn't true. And um, like for the example of the bag, the positive bag and the negative bag, um, wondering how from the example you gave about your research that you've done with the image like how would we know like we could tell by observation what the target is but how would we tell the computer like what is um the target if that's exactly what we're trying to find right so that's a good question april so the idea here in multiple instance learning is that we have bag la uh, level labels so for each bag we know the label of the bag, but we don't know the label of the individual observations in the bag. So it's the job of the machine learning algorithm or the multiple instance learning algorithm to, to in a sense, determine the labels at the sample level, right? And so if that is your question, how are we gonna do that? Well, that's in fact the, the rest of the 30 slides in this talk. That is the crux of multiple instance learning algorithms. How can we design an algorithm from either a heuristic standpoint, right, from a probabilistic standpoint, from a mathematical standpoint, to learn under this scenario. And, and so does, is that, does that answer your question? Is that what you're asking, is how can we design algorithms to do this? Or are yeah. you asking, okay, yeah, great, so that's exactly the question to ask. Right? How are we gonna do this? Right? 
And so let's take a look at that. Right. And so to answer your question, here's step number one, April. Right. So the first algorithm that was designed by the uh, motivating author, Dietrich et al., is this axis parallel rectangle. Right. And so axis parallel rectangles is very intuitive. And in that the idea here is it was a simple heuristic algorithm of greedy, there was a greedy version and, and other versions as well. Right. So where you would go into the feature space and just greedily enclose uh, a hypercube, if you will, right, uh, around all of the samples from the positive bags so that there was at least one sample from each of the positive bags within the hypercube. And you would shrink it as small as possible, trying to eliminate all of the samples from the negative bag. Right? Thus, in a sense, directly applying that scheme that we would use for the locksmith and the rings. And that is try to identify which area in our feature space contains at least one sample from all the positive bags and no samples from the negative bags. Right? And in that sense, then we would just simply have this key space or this subspace, which identifies or helps to characterize our target observation or the target sample. Right, and so this is a great and very intuitive algorithm in that sense is that it's uh, directly attacking this multiple instance learning problem. Um, it's heuristic, and so it didn't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily meet any sort of uh, optimal criteria. Right? It's not necessarily optimal in any sense. Uh, so although it's intuitive, there's, there's that con, if you will. And another negative to this initial approach is that it does not scale well, especially with respect to dimensionality. So if you're trying to model this with you know, a, a hypercube uh, and doing some sort of greedy sequential uh, removal or pruning of this uh, subspace, right, as the number of dimensions in increases and the number of the samples that you have to loop through increases, it's, uh, uh, it does not scale very well at all. It can be very slow. Right. So, uh, some of the follow-up research tried to pose this within a probabilistic standpoint or, or scheme, uh, because machine learning nowadays is you know, almost all probabilistic, right? or at least many of the algorithms are. And there's a lot of reasons for that, because the optimization uh, can be streamlined uh, and with some assumptions still meet some uh, optima criteria. And so, um, after this, about uh, almost five to 10 years after this, right, once this idea hit the community at large, uh, Marone et al. really sort of started the floodwaters as they, uh, Marone published one of the first uh, probabilistic framework to attack this problem called diverse density. Right? And so the idea here is that you want to build a density function very much like any likelihood function. Right, but based on diversity across the bags rather than individual samples. Right, and so the idea here is that we're going to optimize right, this probability function, right, or some likelihood function, some density function, based on bags of observations rather than individual observations like you would in a normal statistical solution. The idea here is that we would then try to optimize the joint of our positive bags and negative bags so that we could estimate our posterior distribution. And so how, did, how do we enforce diverse density, right? The idea that we want at least one positive sample and no negative samples. Well, as it happens, Marone et al., after doing some research, looked back and found way back, way back in the 80s, right? It seems that long ago, right? Uh, where, uh, the Bible of belief networks, right, uh, proposed by or written by, oh gosh, my memory, Pearl, Pearl et al. Back in the 80s, uh, wrote right, the, the Bible on belief in Bayesian networks. Uh, one of the network models, belief network models that uh, he proposed was this noisy or model. And as it happens, it fits this idea of diverse density and multiple instance learning perfectly. It's great. And so how does it do it? Well, mathematically, it looks like this. Right, so we have one minus. So here we have a bag, the ith bag, 
j samples in each i bags, right? We have one minus the product of one minus the posterior, right? So probability of target given the ith sample, or I'm sorry, the jth sample in the ith bag. And so we can compute the posterior of the bag by accumulating the this value across all of the j samples. So what's the intuition behind that? Well, it's actually quite intuitive. Right? So how can we say that there's at least one sample in this bag that meets the target criteria? Well, statistically or mathematically or using this noisy or, we're saying it as follows, right? It's not the case, right, one minus, that each element, right, the product over j, is not the target concept, one minus the target concept, probability of target, right? So it's not the case that all of the samples in the bag are not the target, right? So what does that mean, logically speaking? Well, De Morgan's law, that's saying there's at least one target in there, right? And so that's right, exactly how we are able to pose this using the noisy or model and a statistical framework. Right? And so uh, some of the first models here just used like simple Gaussian or something similar to a Gaussian or a radial basis function as the basic model. And then you just optimize it using this probabilistic framework. Right? Some of the initial work here uh, for optimization was based on simple gradient descent and exhaustive search. One thing to note here is that this noisy or model, right, think of our other statistical models and think of the noisy or model now, right? If we're just dealing with a likelihood here, how would we optimize this? Well, some of our simple approaches like maximum likelihood or map estimates, we can just simply take the derivative and solve, right? This noisy or here, the one minus the product of the one minus, Taking the derivative of this is not easy. It's not clean. The result is not good All right, from a uh, efficiency standpoint of optimization. So this really complicates optimization and leads to a number of potential issues, sadly. And so that's one of the main drawbacks of using this noisy or model. Optimization can be very, very tedious. All right. And so here's the, the overlying structure of the noisy or gate model. The idea here is that we have some target concept. It can be induced by one of many observations, like many samples in a bag, right? And we have inhibitors that sort of block this target concept, right? It's not the case that each sample is not the target concept. So that's how right, these inhibitors indicate that we have the negation of the target concept that we're then again negating. Right? This idea is causal, referred to as causal inhibition by Perl et al. Uh, again, Perl et al didn't necessarily have this idea of multiple instance learning in mind when designing this noisy OR gate model, but as you can see, it's applicable to multiple instance learning as well as a number of other instances or scenarios. Right. We'll just slide through this. Again, this is just one type of Bayesian network or belief network, uh, and so, from a mathematical standpoint, the optimization was not clean when we look at it from that one standpoint, but there are other optimization schemes for generalized Bayesian networks. Not all of them are efficient, right? but they do certainly exist. Right, since then, it, there's been sort of a, uh, a flood of research in the area of multiple instance learning. Again, since the late 90s, I'd say, to the early 2000s, right? The floodgates opened. And uh, really since 2010, it's becoming, um, there's been quite a bit of research in the general field of machine learning. Uh, though as noted, it's not quite made it uh, to the data science community at large. And so there's a lot of interesting research in uh, various applications that, uh, that still have yet to be explored and investigated. But here are some of the, the uh, initial results that came out of multiple instance learning research. Right, the axis parallel rectangles by Dietrich et al. Right, there was a KNN variation, just a simple KNN variation that incorporated multiple instance learning scheme. Right, uh, also a Bayesian KNN, a rule-based axis parallel rectangle scheme. Uh, we'll look at this in a little bit more detail, but you can tweak and tune 
uh, the objective for support vector machines so that you have a multiple instance learning support vector machine, right? As well as multiple instance learning relevance vector machines, right? Multiple instance learning decision trees, right? Multiple instance learning neural networks, right? There's all sorts of variants of existing models to incorporate multiple instance learning now, which is great. All right, some of the research that I did at the University of Florida looked at this from a set learning standpoint. Since we're dealing with sets, posing this from a, a uh, from the standpoint of learning sets rather than learning samples, right, is also an interesting thing to investigate, right? Uh, in the world of random sets, which is a generalization of a random variable, right, the capacity functional here, which characterizes the probability distribution of a random set, right, is defined in terms of a random intersection operator. And so this idea of intersection is very intuitive in this application because when you, when you think of the positive bags right, and you want to find the commonality of the positive bags, what are you doing? Well, you're taking the intersection of all of these positive bags. Right? And so we designed a random set framework for multiple instance learning, which made real intuitive use of this capacity functional where we could just simply in a statistical framework, take the intersection of all the positive bags and optimize this uh, random set model. And got some really good results from this model as well. Uh, other MIL approaches as well. I think I, I already mentioned a few of those there. All right. So a few other things to note here. Uh, since you guys are familiar with many of these kernel machines. Uh, and since one of the downsides of multiple instance learning is the optimization of the multiple instance learning, I thought I would focus some time on looking at these kernel machines. Number one, because uh, they're, they're really cool and useful and very effective. And number two, if we choose an appropriate kernel function, we can actually sidestep a lot of the optimization issues associated with multiple instance learning. Right. And I was gonna start off with this slide. Since I haven't posted the Bayesian uh, lecture yet, I'm gonna go ahead and skip down to support vector machines first. Right. And so quickly, we'll just review support vector machines. Again, here we have our standard classifier uh, structure or regression structure for a support vector machine, where we have a, a linear back end with our nonlinear uh, front end uh, fee, right? Our uh, kernel function fee, right? With a standard linear back end with our weight vector and possibly some bias. And the idea here, and you know, there's many ways to optimize a, a, an SVM, but one of the standard ones here is to use. Right, our uh, L1 optimization scheme here, where we have, where we have our L2 and L1 slack here. So we minimize the norm of the weight factor, uh, as well as our slack variable here, subject to the constraints that enforce our labeling scheme. Right, so here we have our classifier results. Right, we say that we want these labels to be one for our targets. Right, and then we allow for some slack here, right, to make sure that we don't overlearn or overfit uh, during the learning process. All right, so this is our support vector machine. So how can we change this to account for multiple instance learning? Well, just by tweaking the constraints a little bit, right, we can do this. Right, and so. The SVM can be altered to fit the multiple instance learning problem by changing how the margin is classified and how optimization is then enforced right, via the constraints. Right? That is, we can simply change the constraints so that we boost the margin based on bags rather than the individual samples. And we can do that by making sure that there's at least one sample from each bag in our half space. So how can we do that? Well, by making this following alteration here to our constraints. Right. Note here, we can change this from a standard quadratic optimization to mixed integer optimization, where we toggle 
the labels within each bag between one and minus one, right? By toggle, I like do an integer search, right? And while we're doing this search, this optimization, we enforce, right, the following constraints where we have at least one sample in each positive bag must have a label of one, right? How do we do that? Well, again, with our SVM, we need to have, well, we have our inequalities for the constraints, linear inequalities. And so here we have that enforced right here, where we have for each bag capital I, we can sum over the samples little i, right? And if the label for that, right, if we have at least one label for that, right, then this inequality will be greater than one. So this inequality will be satisfied, right? If all of the samples for our positive bags are zero or negative one, right, then we would not meet this equality, right? Uh, and so that's how we can do uh, enforce that constraint. Uh, similarly, we can uh, enforce the constraint of the negative bags more easily because all of those labels should be negative one, right? And so we have those there. Right? And so just with a simple tweak here, we can tweak the SVM optimization scheme to enforce multiple instance learning. Right? There's been a number of SVM variants. Uh, this is just one, right? There's a number of different ways that people have investigated tweaking and tuning the optimization scheme uh, for the standard support vector machine to incorporate MIL uh, with varying levels of success. All right, next we'll just go back and discuss the relevance vector machine. So uh, again, I haven't posted this. I'm gonna talk about relevance vector machines in more detail in the uh, Bayesian lecture, which, which should be posted soon. All right, the idea here is that we have the same, right, we have a similar linear classifier, if you will, with a nonlinear front end, our kernel function. Right, so we have our weight vector, we have our kernel function, right? Uh, and so rather than optimizing this using all right, a quadratic program like with our support vector machine, right, the Bayesians say, well, let's just put a prior on the weights, right? which is you know, what Bayesians do, let's put priors on things. Right? And so that's what's done here, right? And then rather than doing anything overly complicated, uh, Ray Carr et al. in one of the first Bayesian uh, approaches to multiple instance learning, published in NIPS back in 08-ish, somewhere around there. And uh, this uh, multiple instance relevance vector machine, right, where he just simply wrapped a relevance vector output into a noisy OR gate. Right, so here again, you, we see the noisy OR gate right, with the relevance vector output sort of crammed in there as a posterior. Right, the relevance vector right, with a sigmoid in there right, being used to estimate a posterior. Right, uh, and so that's the, right, that's the for sort of the first go round of, of using a multiple sense relevance vector machine. This was great and everything. However, we can see here, right, whenever, and, and the first thing that should pop in your head when you look at the noisy OR gate is, well, this is great because it enforces the multiple instance learning, but how are we gonna optimize this? Right, this is just a disaster, right? Try to take the derivative and, and things, you know, it's not great. So that's one of the issues there that, that they ran into, it, though it wasn't too bad, right? There was some success here. Again, here we're using this part as an estimate of the posterior, and then we have our noisy OR gate wrapped around it, right? This is great, but the, the optimization is a bit cumbersome. Raycar et al. notes that there's you know, a double loop that can be done to estimate this, right? Uh, right they used a Newton-Ralphson update, right? Uh, computed the Hessian, which is very slow, though it was effective, right? It, I implemented this on it and ran a number of experiments on it uh, as, as well as they did. And it was, it was very, very effective, did very well, especially compared to other approaches, uh, did better than many, many approaches, in fact, but it, it didn't necessarily scale well. It actually, it wasn't too bad for reasonable size data sets. And, um, 
but it was but it was pretty slow as compared to a standard RVM, for example. All right, so why why is this an issue? Well, if we look at the kernel matrix, right? If just like if we were looking at a kernel matrix for a support vector machine, if we look at the kernel matrix here for our relevance vector machine, uh, what's the dimensionality of it here? Well, in a support vector machine, we would have a matrix where we have possibly the number of samples by the number of support vectors. Right? Depending on how you build your kernel function, it's common to do so by having a, to start off with a number of kernels similar to the number of samples, though. Right? There are, of course, many ways and variants of this. Right? Uh, and so during the optimization scheme, the idea here is that we would have to re-estimate, right, given the, the pseudocode on the previous slide, right, the gradients and the Hessian for each one of these right, entries in our matrix here. Right? And so this, this didn't necessarily scale well with respect to the dimensionality or the number of samples. Uh, and so if we take a step back here and say, well, why is this an issue? Well, we took something that was fast and fairly efficient, the relevant vector machine. The RVM has a number of really fast update schemes. Right? There are some really good heuristic schemes to update RVMs where it's sequential, where you can update and learn this model in linear time or less. Right? You don't even have to necessarily loop through all of the data points right, and get reasonable results. Right? There's a number of sequential updates for RVMs that exist out here. So the RVM by itself is pretty fast, pretty efficient classifying machine. However, we threw it in this noisy OR gate model, which it made everything slow with respect to or within the context of optimization. Right? So took something fast, put it inside of something slow, and then tried to optimize it. So how can we try to you know, get around this or sidestep this? Uh, while still keeping multiple instance learning in, in play. Well, rather than taking our RVM and placing it inside of noisy OR, is it possible for us to take this noisy OR or this idea of multiple instance learning and stick it inside of the relevance vector machine? That way, we have the relevance vector machine sort of on the outside, on the back end, and we can just use our RVM optimization. Right? And the answer is yes. Yeah. What, what do we need to do? Well, we need to design a kernel function that encapsulates or incorporates the multiple instance learning problem. And so rather than doing multiple instance on the back end, do multiple instance first and then do RVM on the back end or, or whatever other kernel machine you want to use on the back end. Right? So the results of that would be something like this. So rather than uh, building our kernels based on, or uh, building our kernel matrix based on each of the samples in each bag, we would simply build a kernel matrix where we would map each of our samples right, to a bag. Right? Thus, our kernel matrix would be the number of bags by the number of vectors. The kernel matrix is smaller. Right? The noisy OR is not on the back end, so the kernel matrix is smaller, and we can use a sequential or fast uh, updating scheme. So it's just faster by a number of different ways. And right? we can even go one step further Right, we could use this noisy OR kernel where we, again, embed the idea of the noisy OR gate inside of this kernel function. Right? Or Small et al. recently has proposed a number of kernels where, um, where we would use set-based distances. So there would be a kernel for each set, for each bag, in a sense. And then you would measure the distance between bags, right? So sets to sets. And so each of these kernels are very interesting and intuitive to some degree with respect to multiple instance learning. Uh, the crux or how this works or if it's going to be effective or if it's intuitive is largely based on the distance metric that's going to be used, right? And most kernel applications, Right, the something like a Euclidean or P-norm or some kind of distance metric that's intuitive for Euclidean space or something similar is going to be used. Right. Uh, however, when we're dealing with sets, the idea of set-based distances is not quite as intuitive or well-known in machine learning. Right. There's things like a Hausdorff, Hausdorff distance and um, Earth mover distances. There's all sorts of interesting distances to measure the distance between sets. 
right? Some of them are pretty intuitive for multiple instance learning problems. Some of them aren't, right? And so how well this is going to work is going to be largely based on what type of distance metric is going to be used within these set-based kernels. Right. And so if we were to use the set-based kernels rather than just a standard noisy OR kernel, you would even have a smaller or reduced, at least possibly, uh, kernel matrix where we would have a number of bags right, by number of rel uh, relevant sets rather than relevant vectors. Right. So interesting in that are relevant vectors, are models that are used to drive right, uh, our classifier, our exemplars are actually sets in this case rather than individual samples. Really interesting uh, concept, really interesting idea there. Right, so now that we've embedded the idea of multiple instance learning into our kernel space, we can just use our standard RPM, sequential update, super fast, right, all is well. Uh, just for the sake of comparison to show you some of the research I did on hyperspectral data, uh, pretty large data set, right, uh, high dimensionality as well, right, to give you the, the general results of how fast or how slow the algorithms were. And here's a rock table of a number of the different approaches, or a rock, yeah, a rock chart uh, of the number of different approaches that were used. The fast approaches took about 200 to 300 seconds to train, right, given this pretty large data set, not too bad, right, whereas uh, using our standard RVM, MI RVM with the noisy ore on the outside, took more like 3,000 seconds to train. So we had an, uh, an increased order of training time, or we were able to decrease it by an order, and which is pretty, pretty good, right? Scaled pretty well, right? Uh, on another experiment here where we ran this had, uh, again, just some interesting results here with respect to the area under the curve at different uh, false alarm rates. Uh, but overall, here's the big result for, for switching the embedding of the multiple instance learning on the back end rather than the front end, right, is the training time. And so after doing some more tweaking and tuning and having the sequential training incorporated, uh, the multiple instance learning using the embedded noisy or, or set-based kernels as opposed to standard kernels, right, we had an almost two orders of reduction of training time with comparable results, right? And so this was a pretty interesting and pretty cool result here, uh, as this is one of the major cons for using multiple instance learning. Right? Uh, and so this idea, I think, was really cool. And so th the big takeaway here, and just to sort of wrap things up here and present it now for our purposes, that multiple instance learning is a really powerful and useful uh, variation or, or sub scenario, like learning scenario within the concept of or context of supervised learning. It's encountered quite a bit. Uh, in many instances in standard machine learning practices, it's ignored or mitigated as well as possible, right? Uh, however, many researchers have found if you were to explicitly account for this lack of label information or uncertainty in label information within the model itself during training and or testing, where right, you can get improved results as it allows your learner to be a little bit more flexible right, uh, and incorporate some of this uncertainty during the optimization process. And, uh, I think for this reason, and, and since it's likely that you guys have not been exposed to this concept before, I think it would make for a really fun final project topic. So I'd certainly encourage you guys to investigate this. And another reason why I think you guys might find it fun is that this particular learning scheme is not as popular in the data science community yet. It's certainly gaining popularity, but there's a lot of interesting very, uh, investigation and exploration to be done with respect to models, optimization schemes, and applications. Right? And so, uh, Given your project, and if you were to apply it to a data science problem, right, uh, you may actually make an interesting contribution to the field that would be uh, worthy of publication, for example. And so it would be interesting to possibly try to write this up for a conference paper.
And I would certainly help you guys with that and encourage you to do so if you decided to go this route, right? And the, the results you received were notable or, and or interesting. Uh, just a few notes about that and to maybe get your creative juices flowing with respect to applying this or, or uh, thinking of this learning scenario within data science uh, applications. Right, interesting project ideas. <clears throat> I mean, one of the thing that, things that separates multiple instance learning from standard learning scenarios is that you're learning with sets rather than individual samples. Right. There is an interesting relationship, both uh, conceptually and theoretically, between multiple instance learning and associative rule mining. Right? Uh, you guys are very likely, associative rule mining is very popular in the data science community, but not necessarily in other communities. And so there hasn't been a lot of exploration as to the similarities and differences between these from a, uh, between these methods from a theoretical standpoint, a mechanical or model standpoint, uh, and or an application standpoint. And so that would be an interesting project to look at multiple instance learning and compare and contrast to associative rule mining right, for some sort of application related to data science. Right. You could compare the models that exist. Right? There's a lot of different models for uh, multiple instance learning, though associative rule mining really only has uh, that one standard model with maybe some variants. Right? Applications. Right? There's, there's been a lot of interesting applications for associative rule mining. The, the standard one is you know, the, the shopping cart example, where you just look for general associations. However, there's been a lot of variations and tweaks and tunes to associative rule mining models for the purposes of classification and, and other such things as well. So um, doing a comparison or exploration of different applications for associative rule mining and multiple instance learning or something along those lines I think would make for a really interesting project as well. And then optimization schemes. There are, as I noted, optimization, there are a number of optimization problems associated with multiple instance learning due to the noisy OR gate. Um, however, optimization for associative rule mining using the a priori algorithm or other similar pruning algorithms might have interesting multiple instance learning counterparts. So using some of the optimization schemes for associative rule mining, trying to design and apply those optimization schemes to multiple instance learning models may actually yield a very interesting, very uh, notable result, certainly worthy of publication, right, if you're able to get, uh, get a good result from that. So I think that uh, there's some interesting opportunities here for exploration, possible publication, something noteworthy. And so these are some interesting project ideas. Again, just in general, applying multiple instance learning to new and interesting data science problems, since this is to a large degree relatively unexplored, if you're simply able to find a problem scenario or a data set where multiple instance learning has not really been used previously, right, and you get an interesting result, I think that would be noteworthy. Right, and certainly would contribute to the state of the art and to the community at large. So um, this is where I'll sort of leave, leave it off for you guys. Uh, that's the, the end of this particular talk. And so hopefully I've been able to motivate the idea of multiple instance learning, maybe even pique your interest enough that you might consider it for the final project, uh, though there's a lot of really other interesting projects that you guys can tackle as well. All right, so since this is the, the end here, I'll go ahead and wrap it up and uh, mute myself. Uh, if there are any questions at this point, please feel free to ask. I'll put myself on mute here. <clears throat>
more, guys. If there's no other questions, again, I encourage you to use the remaining time uh, to start coordinating and collaborating with uh, your peers if you plan to do a group project. Remember the final projects, you can work in groups of two if you wish, or individually. Uh, also, if you have plans to um, write a technical paper, I encourage you to start scheduling some times to meet with me just so that I can help you along the way and set you up so that you're uh, so that you're headed along the right path with respect to writing a technical paper. And uh, also, I encourage you to use this time, especially now, uh, this, the remainder of the class, to write up your class proposal. Get those to me as soon as you can so that you can uh, get the approval as soon as you can. Be sure to include in the, in the proposal whether you plan to do a presentation and or a competition and or a technical paper submission. All right, guys, I'll, I'll see you again next week, and I will post a few announcements in the meantime uh, to keep you updated with respect to the exam grades right, and other class details. And thanks, and enjoy the rest of your week.